people to follow Jesus. We hope we do that today, and you go out and want to inspire others. A couple things. I hope you got a program as you came in. Raise your hand if you didn't. The ushers will bring you one. Uh, so growth groups, they're starting. So if you would like to get part of one, check one of these and put it in the offering. Um, yesterday we had serve day. I don't know if you noticed when you drove in, but things are looking much spiffier. So thanks for the 20 some people that came yesterday and worked hard. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Michael, what do you have going on? How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right, that was better. Um, okay, so uh, we have another worship night coming up. Woo! Who was here at the last one? Two people, great. All right, so we want you to come out to worship night. It's going to be May 18th. Uh, we're still working the time out right now. But the last one uh, was really, re really amazing. The one before that was amazing. And so we anticipate that this one, our third one together, is going to be amazing as well. And so please mark your calendars for that. Um, it is a Saturday. Um, and so once we get that time solidified, we'll come back and we'll, uh, we'll uh, give you that time. But it will be May 18th. Um, and then finally, our kids are singing on Mother's Day. And so if you have a kid in kid space or if you have a grandchild in kid space and you want them to be a part, we are meeting on that day. I've had three rehearsals already, so they pretty much know the songs now, but uh, we'll do one more rehearsal on that day. So we'll try to, you know, squeeze them in on that day and try to get them to learn the song really fast if you still want your uh, grandchild or child to be a part of that. And so it'll be uh, May 12th doing the uh, 1045 service. And that's all I have. Do you have any more? Okay, cool. All right, let's get started. Who's ready to worship with us today? All right, I got one woo. Great. All right. For those of you that are watching online, we're so glad that you are here with us today. And as always, if you have some free time on a Sunday, drop by at 9 or 1045 and enjoy an in-person worship service. But those that are here, come on, stand on your feet and let's sing some songs together. Here we go. Good God Almighty.
morning, praise Him in the noontime, praise Him when the sun goes down. Love Him in the morning, love Him in the noontime, love Him when the sun goes down. All right, let's give it up for Jesus this morning. Hallelujah, you're so good. All of our lives you've been faithful. And all of our lives that you've been so good, Lord God.
Amen. Let's clap our hands this morning and give God praise for his goodness. You may take your seats and prepare your hearts for morning prayer. Good morning and welcome to Portland Community Church. My name is Carl Sonnenberg and I'm going to lead us in prayer before Ron's message. I sometimes don't know what or how to pray. Does that happen to you sometimes? I have found that when that happens, I look at prayers in the Bible. So today I'm going to borrow some from David and Chronicles and Psalms, change the pronouns a little bit, so it makes, it makes a good prayer to start with. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we give praise to you and proclaim your name to make you known among the nations what you have done. We sing to you and praise to you, and we will tell all around us of your wonderful acts. We glory, we glory in your holy name, and let the hearts of those who seek you rejoice. We look to you and your strength, and seek your face always. We remember the wonders. We remember the wonders that you have done in your miracles and the judgments you have pronounced. You are the Lord our God, and your judgments are in all the earth. And then in Psalms, as a father has compassion on his children, so you have compassion on those who fear you. So, Lord, thank you for your compassion. For each of us make mistakes. We do wrong things. Therefore, we thank you for Good Friday and for Easter two weeks ago and the forgiveness that is given to us by those days and what happened on those days in a firm hope of eternal life. In the New Testament, we're told to ask for you, ask for needs and help. So we pray specifically. We pray for help for those with financial, health needs, family, and emotional needs, either themselves or their family or close friends. We pray that our ministries at Edgewood Assisted Living and McKay School down the street further your gospel. We pray for those caught in armed conflict and the resultant suffering in Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, Russia, Sudan, and many other places. And as Paul wrote, we pray for our leaders. And uh, we don't have kings here, but we pray for our national, local, and Oregon leaders that whether they know you or not, that their decisions are guided by your values and actual truth. We also pray clarity for our country and each of us as we look to voting this year in the elections and or in the primaries and elections. So help us to focus the rest of our worship here, service here today, including Ron's message on money and finances, so we can inspire others to follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, this is my favorite part of the service. We get to say good morning to each other. So look at the person behind you, in front of you, across from you. Next to you, say good morning. Tell them your name. What part of Oregon you're from? What part of Oregon you're from? And ask them, what is your favorite series? Is it Star Trek or Star Wars? Again, for those of ah.
All right, let's come back together, fam. Again, for those of you who are watching online, thank you for being here. I hope you chose Star Trek because that is probably the best. I'm getting very strange looks from the congregation. I'm sorry. Thank you for joining us today. As we move into this next song, I pray that it really blesses your spirit. I'm asking in the Father's name, reveal your heart to me, yeah. I want to bear the fruit that stays, yeah. so come abide in me, show me your this morning for God and prepare your hearts for our morning message by Pastor Ron. This is the second in a two-week series called If Money Could Talk. In this series, we're not talking so much about money, but we're letting our money talk. Whether you're starting, 
restarting or fine-tuning your faith journey, or you make no claim to be a follower of Christ, we're going to see what our money might say. First thing we found last week that our money might say is I can add meaning to your life, but I am not the meaning of life. The purpose of life is not to see how much we can accumulate, but money does add meaning to our life. Second thing we found that our money might say is the moment you think you own me, I actually own you. We think I worked hard for my money. It's mine. I can do what I want with it. I own it. Well, actually, we don't own anything. Once you understand this principle, you live life with an open hand. You don't own anything. God does. You're not an owner. You're a manager. This means you're not managing your money for yourself. You're managing it for God. All at once, you become more careful with money because you're managing it not just for yourself, but for God. We found that there are five things we do with our money. Spend it, that's all about me. Pay debt, that's about me. Pay taxes, ultimately it's about me. Save it is about me. And give it is about God and others. So me, 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 God and others. This is me first living with leftover giving. Jesus says, flip this. Instead of making money all about yourself, Put God and people first. So he says, give first to him and his kingdom causes, save, pay taxes, pay debt, and spend. When it comes to paying debt, I recommended Dave Ramsey's plan in total money makeover. Make a budget, establish a $1,000 cash reserve. This protects you in case a $300 expense comes up out of the blue. It doesn't throw you into a spin. Establish a three to six month rainy day fund. This is in case you lose your job. This is for a big medical expense or housing or your car dies. Pay off all non-mortgage debt. This would be credit card or cards. Put 15% into long-term investments and then pay off your mortgage. Uh, Jesus says, flip the script and make giving your top priority and saving your second priority. Today I want to share with you two more things I think our money might say. The third thing I think our money might say is you think that because of me, you don't need anybody. In the United States, we applaud self-sufficiency. We think that our money will take care of us. We don't need anybody. But the writers of the Bible say that you do need people. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, in this context, he was talking about Adam. He was alone. God says, that's not good. So he made a woman and he established marriage. But the point holds for all people. It's not good for us to be alone. We need friendship. We need accountability. This is why coming to church is so important. We need to walk life with other people. If you're married, your spouse is the number one person to help you not live life alone. In our culture, we're told that you can have your independence even when you're married. You can keep some of your money over here. After all, you earned it, and maybe you earn more than your spouse. In this separate way, you're not combining. You're not unifying. You're running on separate tracks. And it's really hard to win financially in marriage when you and your spouse are on two separate tracks. A couple couple tactical ways to work together in your marriage. One is join your checking accounts. When I say this, some people go crazy. You'd think I took my car and ran over the family dog. It's like they go nuts. When you get married and the pastor or priest say you're one, it means in all areas, including your money. When you keep your money separately, it's like a wedge in your marriage. Money is one of the leading causes of divorce. Pooling your money forces you to talk about it. Sure, it's difficult, but it's worth it. This leads to another thing you should do. Budget together. Sit down and do a budget together. More than likely, you have different ideas about money. 
Maybe one of you is a saver. Maybe one of you is a spender. Uh, one of you hears it and say, oh, he's talking about budget. That's fantastic. The Holy Spirit's moving. I'm going to get out my Excel and uh, force my wife or husband to do a budget together. I'm so excited. The other of you is saying, I'm not so excited. Budget is sort of like it's, you feel like you're suffocating. It feels like you, you can't have any fun anymore. A budget is a way for you to spy on your money. You can see where it's going. There should be no mystery about where your money is going. A budget is people telling their money what to do. Some experts say you can save 33% just by having a budget. Jesus said, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish it. Jesus says you need a budget so you know if you can afford something. A fourth thing our money might say is the best thing you can do with your money is to become rich toward God. Jesus tells a story about this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. A younger brother comes and asks Jesus to talk to his older brother to divide the inheritance. If you've been involved in dividing a state, you know how long it can take and how acrimonious it can be between siblings. Jesus cuts to the core of the problem. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Rather than becoming embroiled in the feud, Jesus cut to the chase. He knew that what, the, what was causing the fighting was greed. The older brother, both brothers were greedy. The older brother was greedy by refusing to divide the inheritance, and the young brother was greedy by dying to get his hands on the money. Now we're ready for Jesus' story, the parable. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Nothing wrong here yet. Jesus doesn't think there's anything wrong with having a good year financially. He's not against wealth. He has no issue with success. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. If the man didn't do something with what he earned, he would move into a higher tax bracket. So he built bigger barns and sunk the money back into the company. Again, nothing wrong here yet. This man has an unusual problem. He has more money than he knows what to do with. If this is your problem, see me after the service. <laughs> and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. He took care of himself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This man asks an important question. What shall I do with all my money? But he arrives at the worst possible conclusion, to keep it all for himself. He sees his money as something to benefit himself and his luxury exclusively and not be used for any other purposes, for God or people. Suddenly his plan goes terribly awry because his purpose for storing wealth was all selfish and has nothing to do with God. He thinks his wealth sets him up to live luxuriously and he doesn't need God. The surprise in the parable is that the man who is wealthy, who by Israeli standards would be considered a righteous man, Jesus calls a fool. The irony is that when the man thinks he's most ready for life, he's the least ready. He can afford the finest in medical care, but he can't control 
the day of his death. Then Jesus pulls out of the parable and finishes with this one poignant line. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. This is how it will be, Jesus says, for those who have a me-first attitude toward money and are not rich toward God. Our money might say, the best thing you can do with your money is to become rich toward God. Here's the question. How do you want people to celebrate you after you're gone? What do you want people to thank you for? So how do you become rich toward God? Jesus tells us how. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. We saw this last week. Jesus says He wants to spend our money first on what's best for Him and His Father's kingdom and for people. Give to God before you take care of yourself. The irony, as we found last week, is that when we use money as Jesus invites us to, we have more financial margin. You say, how do you know that? Jesus says so. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. He says, flip the the script, use your money first for God and for people, and all these things will be given to you as well. What things? Housing, transportation, medical, school costs, clothes, food, utilities, everything else will be given to you as well. Jesus says, if you put me first, and my Father's kingdom causes first, I will take care of your other needs. And it's a promise. I'm always amazed when I talk about putting God first, giving to Him first before we take care of our other expenses, how many people object that I'm saying that if you give to God, He'll give back to you. But that's essentially what Jesus says. He says, if you give to Him first, He promises to help you with your other needs. When you give to God first, you're inviting God to become supernaturally involved in your finances. You give and trust God to supernaturally meet your needs. You give and trust Jesus' promise. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul said the same thing. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply, and notice this, and increase your store of seed. You commit to giving God first, and then he promises to supply your needs and even increase what you have to give and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Paul says if we give generously to God, he will stretch the remainder of our money. He will expand it so we can give to still other needs. Shory's father and mother made a practice of tithing, giving to God first tenth of all that they earn. And at some point in his life, he made a decision that each year he would increase the percentage that he gave away. He told Jory, he says, it's amazing. Every time I made a decision to give more, God gave me more. So I had still more to give. And by the end of his life, he was giving away 50% of all that he earned. If we trust Him with our finances, He will make it His mission to become supernaturally involved in blessing and protecting our finances. So giving becomes an adventure in obedience to God and then watching Him provide supernaturally. God says, I like the way you're handling your money. I like the way you're living within your means. I like the way you're saving. I like the way you're not spending it all. I like the way you're giving to me and you're trusting me that I will provide for you. So, I can give you even more to manage. Although I've seen God provide like this in thousands of lives, I must add that I also see faithful Christians in some part of the world who are very poor. It's hard for me to see how God's blessing them financially. So I'll add... Sometimes Jesus' promise may not be fulfilled until he comes again. 
Jesus' words in our journal that we read this week. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid when? At the resurrection of the righteous. In some case, some cases, the reward may not come until Christ returns. But in the vast majority of cases, I see that God blesses and gives his favor to people in this world. Imagine two friends, let's call them Mike and Jim, who are Christ followers. They've both been Christians the same length of time. But Mike has a little more faith in this area of God's provision. Jim, not so much. Jim says, hey, listen, Mike, I've got to get from A to B financially, and it's going to take 100% of my earnings. It's simple math. It works. I need 100% to get from A to B. Mike, on the other hand, listens to what God's Word says about this and decides, I need to, I need to get from A to B too, but I believe God can take me from A to B on just 90% of my earnings. I'm going to give 10%, as God instructs in Scripture, as a tithe to the purposes of God, and I believe in response to my faith that God will take me from A to B, but also to C. In His Word, He promises to pour out blessings, and I want to take Him up on it. This new place, C, isn't even on Jim's radar. He's doing the simple math. His roadmap ends at B. Mike finds that in Scripture, C is described as the place of favor. Mike doesn't know exactly what C would look like, but he's pretty sure it's going to be more exciting than just going from A to B. Every Christ follower I've known who has applied this faith-filled practice in their lives has some C stories to tell you. Stories of answered prayer, God's provision, surprise uh, opportunities. There's nothing like being obedient to God in this way and seeing that God has some sea stories in mind. The anticipation alone brings energy and excitement. Here's what utterly fascinates me. Both Mike and Jim think the other guy is an idiot. Jim looks at Mike's 90% plan. He says, are you kidding? Really? It can't be done. You're an idiot. Mike looks at Jim and says, maybe a little more kindly, no offense, man, but you're the idiot because the most you can ever hope for is to move yourself from A to B. Big deal. Boring. That's what everybody signs up for. On your plan, 100% plan, you'll get from A to B like I will, but you'll never get to experience the C stories of the journey from B to C. You'll never know the feeling of God being supernaturally involved in your finances. You'll never experience being favored by God. You'll never see the privilege of seeing what God might do in your life beyond B. The real living happens between B and C, my friend. So pardon the fun, pardon the pun, but this is where the money is. You're the idiot. Sign me up for the B to C plan. I ask you right now, which kind of idiot do you want to be? I want to be the faith-filled idiot, and I have been ever since I began earning wages as a sophomore in high school. And I would never go back. Let me ask you, at what point in your life would you finally drive a stake in the ground and say, sign, sign me up for the B to C plan? The first tenth goes to God by faith. You give and trust God to supernaturally provide for your needs. Here's a suggestion. Set it up electronically. You never see it. Do the same with your savings. You say, Ron, you don't understand. I'm broke. 
Every penny I earn, I have to spend and to, to pay the debts of what I've already bought. I don't have any money to give. Jesus says, flip the script. Don't be like everybody else who spends and pays debt and then gives only if there's anything left over. Give to him first and trust him to help you meet your other needs. If you flip the script and try to give to God first, you're going to have an internal dialogue like, if I give first, I'll be paying student loans until I'm dead. You have to decide if you believe God's promise. Last week in our journal, we read the story about Elijah, prophet in Israel. People of Israel had disobeyed God, so God withheld rain. So nothing was growing. So God told Elijah, you go outside of Israel, and I have a widow there who will take care of you. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. <clears throat> he called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. If you're broke, this lady is your gal. She doesn't have anything. But God asks her to give to him first. Elijah says, bring me first some bread. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. God's saying the same thing to you today. You don't have any money, you're broke. Try this, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make me a small loaf of bread. For me, from what you have, and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. So there it is. She's broke, doesn't have anything. God doesn't say, well, yeah, I know you don't have anything. Forget it. Don't, don't. I'll get somebody else to make you bread. He doesn't do that. Bring me the bread first. Then here's the promise. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up. And the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. So the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. God asked her, him, her to give to him first. He asked her to trust him. Then he fulfilled his promise to meet her other needs. Other needs. Maybe you're thinking, once I pay off my credit cards, repay my school loans, and God sends a lot more money my way, then I'll give. If you're waiting until you're rich to give, you're going to be waiting a long time. An economist, E.F. Clark, had, uh, wrote what he called the 25% rule. Wherever you are financially, you want 25% more. And when you get to that level, you want 25% more. And it keeps going. How much do you have to earn before you don't want 25% more? Nobody has ever gotten that much money. A couple just out of graduate school and marrying in their 20s want to be generous someday, but not now. They still have oppressive student loans. They're just getting started in their careers, just starting building a family. They're trying to make a down payment on a home. They deeply desire to be generous people, but just not now, later. And then kids arrive, and kids are expensive. They go from two incomes to an income and a half. Then as the kids grow older, they want to help with their college expenses. They turn 40 and want to start putting money into retirement. All of a sudden, they're 50. And for 30 years, they've been saying later, which really meant no. Do you really think you're going to be able to reverse a rut you've been in for 30 years? The word later is lethal 
It can cripple giving to God. Ask yourself, why am I so resistant? Why, when I hear Jesus promise, seek me first and I will, all these other things will be added to you, why do I have a hard time believing that? When it comes to giving, I urge you not to think in terms of amounts, but think in terms of percentages. Maybe today you say, I'm all in. First tenth goes to God. Maybe you say, uh, not so fast, that's just too much. Well, then pick a smaller percentage. Then do the same with saving. I could share, hundred, share hundreds of stories with you of people who have taken that step of faith to give to God first. And they say, I don't know how to describe it, but I'm better off now financially than before I made that commitment. Rick Warren, the former lead pastor of Saddleback Community Church, where Michael worked at one of the campuses, um, wrote, Purpose Driven Life and Purpose Driven Church. They have sold more copies than any other Christian book in history, except the Bible. Before he signed the two-book contract, he and his wife Kay made a pledge to a Saddleback uh, building campaign. They pledged three years' salary. That was one of the largest churches in the country, so that was a big gift. Shortly after making that commitment, the advance came the same amount as they just pledged. I feel so strongly that if you trust God and trust Jesus' promises, that he will get supernaturally involved in your finances, that I offer on our website the three-month tithe challenge. You go to the giving tab, and it's right there. If you make the commitment for three months, I'll try this. If you're not satisfied in three months, if you're not doing, feel like you're in a better spot, we'll give you all your money back. Here's the main point I've tried to share with you today. You got any more over the back there? The best thing you can do with your money is to become rich toward God. I urge you not to be like everybody else. Flip the script. Give to God first and trust Him to meet the rest of your needs. And in doing so, you will become rich toward God. Let's pray. Father, thank You for these passages we've looked at today in Your Word, mostly from Jesus. And uh, we want to believe Your promise, Jesus. In some ways, we're going to try. We're surprised, God, that you talk about money so much in your word, but I guess you just are relevant, and you know how much we think about it. So thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's your program. Again, I hope you received one when you came in. Uh, inside is a communication card, like for every one of you here today, and if you're online, you can access this through the email we sent you. about yourself if we do not have it and then check any bubble that speaks for you my next step today recognize that i own my i don't own my money i simply manage it for god understand that having money doesn't mean i don't need money commit to become rich toward god <coughs> trust that if i give to god first he will help me meet my obligations take the challenge do lesson three in the journal so one of the unique things about our church we have a journal to go along with the messages if you do lesson three this week, you'll be ready for what I'm going to talk about next week. I committed my life to Christ today for the first time, if you did. I plan to attend Starting Point next Sunday, April 21st, 12 to 2.30, Bible Need Child Care. The Starting Point is for people who are new to the church, maybe new to faith, and uh, I teach that, and I'd love to have you join me next week. How can you take the next step with God, with Christ? How can you uh, get more involved in the church? So 
So love to see you for that. Check that if you would like to be part of that. All right, I want to invite Sam and Amy Miller, or certainly Amy Miller, uh, to come on up here. Um, and I asked them to share a little bit about their giving. So Amy, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, so Sam was here for service that we talked about tithing, and um, he's at um, the Edgewood Elder Care Facility volunteering there right now. So it's just me. Um, but we do make our money decisions together, and um, we had um, a couple of instances where, um, you know, times were tougher than others. And one of those is when um, our daughter was a baby, Simone, and she's up here on the far left. Or actually, she was up here for service on the far left. Now she's back with the other kids. Anyway, um, we were having a hard time um, with agreeing on the tithing, and we talked about it, we prayed about it, and we, we basically decided we're going to do it. And at this time, Simone was a baby. Um, we had a special formula that was $21.99 a can. That was 13 years ago, okay? That was a, a lot for two every, like, three weeks cans of that. Um, and then we were also, she was growing so quickly, it was, you know, clothing, all those expenses, and we were struggling. And so the temptation was to, you know, let's pause our tithing, um, which now, by the way, I do do electronically, so it's not tempting during those hard times to pull it back, right? Um, that trust issue is, is ongoing sometimes. But anyway, um, two things happened. The, 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 C, the C part that Ron was talking about, um, and... Uh, it's so right on. I mean, everybody probably has a, a story in their lives that God, you knew it was God. Well, this was something that happened where my brother um, had a church he was going to, uh, Marlene Village, kind of by the Village Baptist Church. And uh, we would go there, and we'd also, we were attending Sunset. And we were debating this. And um, the lady that was one of the members there just so happened to be the rep in conversation for the cans that were $21.99. She goes, follow me. And I went to her house, and in her garage, she had cases of this formula. And um, the ones that were almost expired about every three months, she'd give me cases of that. And uh, I didn't have to worry about that anymore. And that was pretty immediate. And then within a day of... Um, that agreement, my husband and I, one of our dear friends, ha you know, we're older parents, um, had a grandchild, and that grandchild was three months older than my little baby, and she um, would, you know, grow out of her clothes, and he would bring over, and he did like the day or two after we made this decision, and um, three big, you know, glad bags, huge bags of clothing like within just days of, of that decision. So I'm just here to say that um, I, took, I took also the Dave Ramsey class that you guys um, did at, at, the, at church, and that was eye-opening for me. And then also in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, um, the one that scares me is Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> A little scary um, where they kind of held back on their tithe. But anyway, we don't need to go there. Um, but then Malachi, you know, in the Old Testament, how, you know, um, where he says, test me on this, you know, to bring the first tenth. So it's hard to make that decision to bring the first tenth. But um, I know that there are many more testimonies in here. Um, and it would be cool if you guys would share that after the service while we're eating lunch. <laughs> Tell us about your roof. That oh, my Sam gosh, mentioned. that's right. Sam mentioned that. First service. So um, our roof got worse during the storm. Our roof has needed to be replaced for years, years, and uh, it was very clear that we um, needed to um, replace it after the recent storms. Um, I'm talking about water damage happening. So um, right around Christmas, my brother, um, um, my mom has an estate, and so he was um, saying, hey, you know, we, um, the siblings, we have a gift, and it was enough to um, cover the cost of a complete roof, um, a complete roof replacement, and um, then a little donation um, uh, here and there. So we are continuing to feel blessed and um, will remain faithful. It's, 
it's just God provides, yeah. All right, as we uh, finish up our uh, worship service today, we're going to sing a song. So why don't you stand together and join as Michael and the team comes and uh, as, as he leads us in this final song. If you have not yet told God how much you love him, how grateful you are, what he means to you, this is your chance. Sing it out with all you've got. As the band gets ready to play, um, maybe giving has been a challenge for some of us. Um, Amy, she said, um, man, to give the first tenth, I mean, it's kind of scary. <laughs> um, but I imagine that um, God would speak to you in this moment. and He would call you to step out into the water, so to speak. Um, one of the things that God ministered to me was that tithing is not a debt that we owe, but it's a seed that we sow. And so I just want to encourage anybody here as we sing this song, if you're in that place of just like scared, like that you would take that step of faith today and plant a seed. And I believe that as Amy and as those who've um, shared before um, in, the, in the previous weeks that you will begin to see um, even greater things as an act of obedience unto the Lord and Him calling you to sow to the kingdom of God.
sing, Spirit, lead me. of the series will be on parenting but before we can get to parenting we gotta probably pick the right mate so next week signs that you're dating the wrong person um, so I want to encourage you if you know you're dating and you may have a friend if boy you think I don't really like his choice in women bring them along maybe you're a parent Maybe you're a grandparent, you're concerned about choices your kids are making, bring them along. This series is for really every one of us. Um, the beginning of a series is the time to bring somebody. I was so proud of you folks on Easter. So many of you brought people. Let's try to bring them again. And uh, I hope to see you next Sunday. All right, Michael has something he wants to share. So in conjunction with that, 